All right. Well, I think we can get going now. Uh, thanks for coming. The, the weather is bad, so you guys on Zoom, uh, you did a good thing. Um, Took you guys in Florida. <laughs> especially you guys in Florida. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jeff, would you lead us? Sure. Almighty God, we appreciate you. Amen. All right. Well, what I want to do, uh, the last time we met a couple weeks ago, uh, I was in the middle of uh, introducing John, the apostle. And I want to finish that. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, we have covered already Matthew, Mark, and Luke regarding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, those are called the synoptic gospels. Uh, they are, um, they're not exact, but basically they're, they're telling the same story, three different angles at it, but you get very similar information from those three. John is a whole other animal. John, um, John, uh, I, I, well, let's just get into what I want to share with you here. And if you have your Bible with you, if you haven't done so already, you might want to go ahead and, and bookmark uh, John chapter 13 will be there, I hope, before too long. Um, so continuing the introduction um, of the importance of the books of John in the Bible, um, can anyone name, uh, besides Jeff and Marcia, uh, the, the books in the Bible that are written by John the Apostle? Wow, you guys need a need the Bible study a lot. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, there's three of them. First, second, third, John. John. Pardon me. John. John, the John. Gospel according to John. And Revelation. And Revelation. Okay, and uh, and so those books are very important as as they all are, um, and John's. The flavor of John's writing comes through in, in all of those. Um, when we talk about Revelation, uh, you're never going to understand the book that John wrote called Revelation um, if you're looking about what that book is all about instead of who that book is all about. Um, who is the book all about? I'll give you a hint. Revelation 1.1 begins this way. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So that book is about Jesus Christ as, as well as all the books um, point to Jesus Christ. So you really need to understand that what John is doing is he is revealing to us Jesus Christ in his glory. And, uh, and as verse 1 says in Revelation 1, uh, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and the, the revealing of the things that are going to come. Um, it's good and right for us to know also that the entire Bible points to Jesus Christ, Old Testament and New Testament. And I'm really excited when we get through with uh, John here, as far as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, I am thrilled. We're gonna go to the Old Testament and we're gonna look at uh, how the Old Testament points to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, for instance, uh, John 5, 46, you don't need to turn there, but if you want to make a note for later, John 5, 46, Jesus said this, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So Jesus is saying, Moses wrote about me. It's not that I'm a newcomer. Uh, this is, this is uh, what the prophets, this is what Moses wrote about. Luke 24, 27, Luke 24, 27, Jesus says to the men going to Emmaus, uh, well, it, this verse 27 goes this way in Luke 24, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. Now, there wasn't a New Testament then. Jesus was going through what we know as the Old Testament, and he went beginning with Moses. Guess where Moses begins? Genesis 1, right? He, he begins with Moses and leads through the prophets and tells these men the things that are concerning him in those Old Testament scriptures. Uh, we need to remember, like I said last week, that John had a growing 
revelation of Jesus Christ. And we believe that John was probably uh, the youngest of the group of disciples that followed Jesus that eventually became the apostles. Uh, he was a young man. Uh, I don't know if he was in his late teens, early 20s, but he was a young man. And uh, as we said last week, he was uh, the last, as far as we know, he was the last uh, to die, to go on to meet the Lord. Um, we talked about uh, that there are, um, there's information out there, historical information that would say uh, that, uh, and it's not confirmed, the Bible doesn't confirm it, but that John was boiled in oil and didn't die. Uh, and that, that uh, the Caesar was uh, so afraid of him after that, that he sent him to the island of Patmos uh, for preaching the word of God and, and they just couldn't get rid of him. Um, so uh, we need to remember that John had a growing revelation of Jesus Christ. And you and I need to have a growing revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. Um, if you have been a Christian for one year, and you look back, you should not be the same person that you were a year ago. You should, you should be growing in Christ. Anybody want to amen that? You should be, you should be growing in Christ. Uh, and if you are, are, are a Christian of five years, what a pity if you look back five years ago and you're not much different. Uh, the, the Lord is looking to transform us, Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 2. He wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that renewing happens daily as we experience him. Um, John didn't start out, by the way, being the love disciple. We talked about that last week. He grew into that. Um, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we learn a little bit about John and, and some of the others. Uh, these guys were Galileans. They were considered country boys, clods. Uh, you know, uh, clodhoppers. They were uh, considered to be ignorant and rough around the edges, uh, roughnecks. Uh, now, uh, verse uh, Acts four thirteen says, "Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, uh, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men." By the way, they they experienced John and Peter, and from the short experience, they they understood that they were uneducated. They understood that they were Galileans. In other words, evidently the way they presented themselves, the way they looked, the way they talked, they didn't sound intelligent. But it says they marveled and realized that they had been with Jesus. Jesus will change you. You don't have to be a brilliant Einstein to follow Christ. Uh, and, uh, and these men may, may have been very rough around the edges, uh, but some of our brothers and sisters in Christ are rough around the edges, but they are tender-hearted Christian Christ followers. And uh, Jesus called uh, John and his brother, uh, James, what? What was the nickname he had for them? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. In Mark chapter 3, verse 17, it says that. And this was not a compliment, by the way. <laughs> we might think of that, wow, I'd like to have a nickname like that, Son of Thunder. But that was not a compliment. They, Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are wild. You're unstable. You're roughnecks. In uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Luke 9, 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? This is not the disciple of love. <laughs> this is a disciple of violence here. And uh, so John came a long way, didn't he? He came a long way. And you and I, we really do need to have a rearview mirror. And every once in a while, look back and say, am I growing in Christ? You really need to take stock of that. Uh, am I growing in Jesus Christ? Because to stay the same is not a good thing. That is not the intention of our Lord for us. Um, John, he is a long way at that point from being uh, the loved disciple. Uh, Matthew 20, also in Mark chapter 10, we read this account of, of uh, uh, the mother of uh, Zebedee 
uh, I'm sorry, the mother of Zebedee's sons. This is Salome. We talked about her last time. We, we believe this is probably Jesus' aunt. Uh, so that would make uh, John Jesus what? Cousin. Um, it says, uh, then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him, came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. So these guys wanted to be in power. James and John, the sons of thunder, these roughnecks from, from Galilee, they, the fishermen, they, their mother, they got their mom to come and talk to Jesus. Why? Well, Jesus isn't going to turn down his aunt. You know, so, uh, but that, that isn't what happened, right? That isn't what happened. Uh, Jesus then told them, You're, this is not for, for, uh, for you. It's my father will choose who's in power. Uh, John refers to Jesus. Listen to this. When we talk about the unique things about John, John isn't unique to referring to Jesus as a lamb or mentioning the lamb. Um, however, John refers to Jesus as the lamb of God 27 times in the book of Revelation alone. The whole New Testament only refers to Jesus as the lamb of God 31 times. 27 of them are John in the book of Revelation and a couple more beyond that. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we talked about that. Uh, they are the synoptic gospels. John is not. Um, but when we talk about those synoptic gospels, let me tell you one of the humongous difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke as a, as a synoptic gospel package and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote mostly about the last year of Jesus' ministry. From the birth, the tempting in the desert, the baptism, the Holy Spirit, and then Matthew 4, Luke 4, and Mark 1 jump into Jesus' last year of ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke identify it as after John the Baptist was put in prison, two years after Jesus had started his ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, tell us only of one Passover other than the one where Jesus died. John tells us of three Passovers and the one at his crucifixion. Listen, if you take notes, here's some notes for you. John chapter 2, verse 13. This is the first mention of Passover in the gospel according to John. Passover uh, of the temple cleansing in A.D. 27. John 5, verse 1. Passover of the healing uh, by the pool spring, A.D. Uh, 28. John 6, verse 4, Passover just before the feeding of the 5,000, A.D. 29. And John 12, 1 and verse 12 also, Passover of the triumphal entry in A.D. 30. Listen, we might not have known, had it not been for John, we might not have been able to confirm that Jesus' ministry was a three-year ministry if it was not for the gospel according to John. John is a jewel. This, this book of John, the gospel of John is a jewel. Uh, John wrote that gospel, um, I believe sometime between the years 85 and 95 AD, about 60 years after Jesus died. And it was well beyond when Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospels were written. That means that John was probably well aware of what the other three guys wrote. Probably well aware. John knew the content of the other Gospels, and that's why you will find unique information in John's Gospel. And we know toward the end of, of uh, the Gospel of John, John says, uh, there's so much I could have written. And indeed, I, I bet there was. There, there just had to be so much he could have written about all the days that John spent with Jesus. But he says, I wrote these that you would believe. Uh, we see other miracles and other things happening in the synoptic gospels that John doesn't write about. But John uh, takes it and, and tells us the rest of the story. He's like, uh, what was that guy? Uh, Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. And here's the rest of the story. That's John. John chapter 2. Let me just give you some examples of 
why this gospel is so important to our faith. John chapter 2, he's the only writer to mention the first miracle. The first miracle was what? Turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. John chapter 3, oh my goodness. What if we didn't have the story about Nicodemus? And, and the words, you must be born again. What if we didn't have that? John 3.16, for goodness sakes. What if we didn't have that? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We wouldn't have that if it wouldn't have been for the Holy Spirit guiding John to write what he wrote. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. We wouldn't have that. John chapter 5, the lame man at the pool for 38 years. John chapter 8, and I know it's disputed whether John chapter 8 uh, about the woman caught in the act of adultery. There's some conflict about whether that even belongs in the Bible or not. Personally, I believe it does. The woman caught in adultery. Uh, he who has not sinned, throw the first stone. That story would not be there in the Bible that we know if it wasn't for uh, John being guided by the Spirit to write that. John chapter 9. Uh, the man blind from birth is healed. You know, Jesus healed other blind people, but this man was blind from birth. It's not like repairing an accident that happened sometime in the person's life. This guy had never seen before. John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But that is a powerful story, isn't it? Praise God that he... Press John to write. John 13, we wouldn't know about the washing of the disciples' feet. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. We wouldn't have that. John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you haven't spent much time in the book of John, you need to get there. And spend some time. In fact, let me tell you this. If you have a friend that is teetering on belief or non-belief, point them to the gospel of John. It's easy to understand. And, and there's a heart of love in John. It is John telling us that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the word. And the word uh, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Um, point people to the book of John. Tell them, do you have a couple of hours? And just read slowly through it. Could you spend two hours for your eternal soul? And when you're done reading, give me a call. I'm telling you all of this. Because John had a growing relationship a growing revelation of Jesus Christ in his life. And you and I need to have that same thing. The things that John saw before when he was with Jesus, before Jesus ascended to be with his father, those things that he saw and heard, they grew in John. And with the Holy Spirit's guidance and opening to him the meanings of the things that Jesus said drew John into a deeper and deeper relationship with Jesus and the Lord does that with you and me today it is not unique to John have you prayed the prayer Lord have your spirit open to me the word today Help me to understand, Lord. I don't want to just read black ink on white paper. I want to know you. I want to know you, Lord. Please open scripture to me so that I can have an understanding that I don't have today. Let me know you better so I can draw closer to you. John had that kind of a growing relationship. And John wrote his gospel account decades after the cross of Jesus. 
Here's something that, that uh, I learned in a seminar once, and it wasn't a seminar on, on Christianity at all. It was a, it was a business seminar, and uh, the saying goes something like this. It's, it's talking about uh, growing as a manager, growing as a, as a person. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, when you're green, you're growing. When you're ripe, you rot. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people that think they're ripe, right? There's a lot of people that think, I'm here. What else can I learn? I've read this book 20 times. Hey, that is not the attitude to have. We need to have a growing relationship with the Lord. And we need to be hungry to learn more, know more. We need to be like Moses. I want to see you. I want to see you. Is your revelation of Jesus Christ growing through the years or is it stunted? You've got to keep meeting with Jesus. You have to meet him in the scripture. You have to meet him in prayer. You have to meet him as the preacher preaches the message from the word of God. You need to meet him in Bible study. You need to meet him in your service to the Lord. You need to share in his suffering and share in his giving and share in his love. Um, do you recognize when you have an experience from the Lord? Do you recognize when God's hand actually reaches into your life. I, I'm really, I've debated up until this moment, I've debated to tell this story. It's a story I've told Dave and Sue, um, and I'm gonna try to shorten it up. But I will tell you, Marsha and I have had so many experiences where we just wanna break out the symbols and crash them and, and shout to the world how God has been so good and reached into our lives in a way that it's unmistakable. It can only be the Lord. Here's a story. Um, we had a Ford 500, great car, uh, and it had a lot of trouble. And it was our only car. And I was preaching in, in Titusville and uh, not making much money. In fact, the car had so many problems that when we took it for a state inspection, which I don't think you have here, uh, took it for a state inspection, it wouldn't pass, and it was going to cost hundreds of dollars and hundreds of dollars more than the car was actually worth to get it fixed. Um, we prayed about it daily. Um, it was important that we have a car. We moved into town just a few blocks from the church, so if we had to, if we ever had to give that car up because we couldn't afford it, we could walk to church. Um, but here's the thing. We ended up um, bringing a whole bunch of people to church in that car. And on any Sunday or on any Bible study day, we were busy picking people up all over the place. We didn't have a church bus. We would be the bus. And, uh, and so we prayed. I also asked the congregation to pray, but I didn't tell them for what. I didn't tell them we had a problem, it wouldn't pass inspection. I said, we just have a special need, please pray. But Marsha and I were praying. Well, we got a call from Marsha's parents, and, uh, and I wasn't in the room where she took the call. And I came into the room, and she's hanging up the phone and looking at me and saying, Mom and Dad just called. They want to give us $6,000 to buy a car. Just out of the blue. They said, we know, we know that car eventually is not going to be running. It's an older car. We want to help you out. We just, we just feel like we want to help you out. $6,000. And so we could, and we did. Boy, did we cheer about that, right? That was amazing. Listen, the same day I get a call from my dad, my stepdad. He and I had our times when I was young, um, not getting along. In his older days and in my older days, we got along a lot better. But out of the blue, he calls me. He's, he doesn't have much money. He was a lineman for Logansport Utility here. Um, and he says, uh, hey, how's that car running? Now, I know that he hasn't talked to Marsha's parents. I know it because they don't talk. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, I'd like to give you $1,000 so that you can fix that car of yours. Um, because I, I, I told him when he asked, how's that car running? I said, well, we got problems, to be honest with you. I'm not going to hide it from him if he's asking. And he says, I'm going to send you $1,000. And I said, well, listen, um, here's the thing. 
Marsha's mom and dad just called. I explained that to him, and he says, I'll send you $1,000 anyway. So now you got $7,000 to buy a car. So we look in the newspaper, and there's a car in Butler, Pennsylvania, a couple hours away from us, the same kind of car, uh, Ford 500. It was easy for Marsha to get in and out of with her hips and her knees, uh, the problems. So we drove to Butler just to look at it. We did a foolish thing. When I say we, I mean me. Uh, we drove to Butler, and when we got almost there, I realized I had not even looked at the gas, uh, the fuel gauge on the car, and we were nearly out of gas. We didn't have enough gas to get home, and we were broke. So we drive into the dealership. I thought, well, we're already here. Let's just go to the dealership and see what we can find. And we looked at the car, and it was beautiful. It was great. It only had, I don't know, like 50,000 miles or something like that on it. And uh, it was in brand new condition. And, uh, and we started talking to this young salesman who was brand new there. And we find out he's a Christian. And not only is he a Christian, but he, he came from a church in Sandy, uh, Sandy Lake, Pennsylvania, where we had brought a singing group over to our church to sing. And, uh, and he knew that singing group, and, and uh, we talked about his parents there in that church. And, and we just had a great visit, and we thought, well, there's something going on here. Uh, the manager came out, he looked at our car, and he says, I don't want your car. <laughs> it was so bad, he didn't even want it. Um, but the manager ended up changing his mind. We ended up telling, uh, telling this young salesman, please go back and talk to him. While he went back and talked to him, Marsha and I prayed. And he came back and he said, yeah, I'll give you X amount. Still not enough to buy this other car. Uh, we ended up with an $800 difference that we just couldn't resolve. And, and so I said to Marsha, we went out and took a break and just talk by ourselves in a parking lot. And I said, I'm gonna call the leaders of the church because there was a time when we couldn't make a utility payment in our home and they lent us a little bit of money and we paid it right back. Um, and so I said, I, I called three people, three of the leaders that we could get a hold of and every one of them said, sure, uh, we'll give you the $800 and, uh, and just pay it back. So we went back and we said, we have this all set, um, but we don't have any of the money today. Uh, my dad's sending a check, uh, Marsha's parents are sending a check, and I don't have the check until I get back to Titusville for the other one. Will you hold the car for us? He said, no. He said, you're just gonna drive it home. And I said, what? And he says, yeah, you're just gonna drive it home. Post date a check. And, uh, and give it to us for whenever, if it's gonna be a couple weeks before you get all the checks, and, uh, and drive it home. And, and here's what they did too. They gave us a full tank of gas in the new car. <laughs> and, and as we're leaving town, we get out on the highway on our way back home and we are praising God. And then I get a phone call. I pull the car over and it's one of those leaders that we called who said, Jim, we're not gonna loan you the money. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the money. We got that car free. And I tell you this, every car that we've had since that car, we have not paid a penny for. I mean, somebody paid a penny for it, but we haven't paid a penny for a car, nor did we ask anybody for it other than the Lord. We're driving a car that we didn't pay a penny for. And the Lord is so good, and, and I tell you what, we have those kind, of, um, those kind of experiences where we know it can only be God. Have you had those? I know that you have. Are you recognizing those things? Are you praising him? Or does that draw you closer to him? I mean, God loves to show favor to his children. Amen? He loves to show favor to his kids. We've seen countless healings miracles and answered prayer and it's all been shocking stuff and john was used to seeing shocking stuff from jesus shocking great stuff 
from Jesus. But I'm sure we still don't recognize everything. I'm, I know I don't. He's involved in our lives. He's very involved in our lives. In the, in the first chapter of Revelation, John talks about uh, he sees Jesus and he's standing among the candlesticks. Um, the candlesticks are the churches. Jesus is in the midst of his churches. He doesn't leave us alone with a business plan. He is the church, amen? He is the leader of the church. He's the head of the church. And John understood that and he saw it. He saw it there in the book of Revelation. John had a revelation also of himself in Jesus. When he wrote these verses, uh, you can tell that John began to understand his, his relationship with Christ. Not only what John felt about Jesus, but what Jesus felt about John. John 13, 23, and I'm saying these twice so that if you want to take a note, you can. Probably not going to be able to keep up. John 13, 23. Now, there was leaning on the bosom uh, of Jesus, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John 20, verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. This is John describing himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John 21, verse 7. John 21, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, dot, dot, dot. John 21, 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who had also leaned on his breast at supper. And John 19, verses 26 and 27, John 19, 26 and 27, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved. You know, Moses said something, this, this was either brought up in uh, the men's uh, Saturday breakfast or or in a sermon or Bible study or Sunday school, I don't know which, but just recently. Uh, Numbers 12, 3, Moses describes himself as the most humble man on earth. <laughs> Moses himself describes himself that way. John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why did he do that? Why did he say that? John doesn't, John doesn't say doesn't say Peter and I, it's Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. John wrote this gospel well after the others. John is an old man. He, he is probably in his 90s, probably in his early 90s when he writes this. And he says, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think he finally figured it out. And, and here's the secret. That is no secret. You and I are the disciples whom Jesus loves. Goodness, he died on the cross to save you and to save me. Figure it out. Draw close to this Savior. We are the disciples whom Jesus loves. And John figured that out. He grew into knowing that. Things that the other Gospels don't write about, John did. John 13 through 16, it's unique stuff. It is the conversation at the Last Supper. Jesus says, I won't leave you orphans. I will send my spirit, the comforter. In John 14, verse 18. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And John 17, this prayer that many label the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. Now, if you read John 17... And then immediately you, you read the first part of John 18. 
John 18 would indicate that John 17 was prayed before Jesus got to the Garden of Gethsemane. But there's a camp of people, a camp of theologians who also believe that that is out of chronological order and that Jesus prayed that prayer, that that was the whole prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. I, I can't remember if it was Dave Short or somebody in the last uh, few weeks has mentioned this, that that uh, that that prayer in the Garden must have been longer than what we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Father, not my will, but yours be done. And so many believe that John 17 is indeed the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. And you may say, well, that's a, that whole chapter is that prayer. Jesus prays for the Father's glory through him. Jesus prays for his disciples. And Jesus prays for you and me in that order. And those who believe that that is the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, along with the things that John didn't repeat because the other Gospels did. Not my will, but yours be done. Here's what they believe. When Jesus came back to the three, Peter, James, and John, each of those three times, he mentions Peter. Why are you sleeping? It does say they were sleeping. But that could be Peter and James. Those who believe that 17 is the prayer in the garden believe that John, he couldn't sleep. And he heard. And he listened carefully. Remember, Jesus was just a stone's throw away. He was within earshot, I think one of the, uh, one of the uh, translations puts it. And so... Uh, I don't know that to be sure. I'm kind of leaning away from that because chapter 18 would indicate that that prayer in the garden happened afterwards. Um, but it may indeed have been the prayer in the garden. But that prayer in 17 doesn't appear in the other Gospels. John was one of the three who was invited to Jesus to take a deeper look in his ministry. Peter, James, and John. They went to the room where the little girl was raised from the dead. Jesus said, Talitha kumi, which means, young girl, I say to you, arise. Peter, James, and John were invited to the mountaintop of transfiguration with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And Peter and James and John were asked by Jesus to come a little closer when Jesus prayed in the garden. We're going to begin now, and we're just going to begin in John 13. As we begin John 13, um, you need to know that, um, for one thing, Scott preached about John 13 on the 24th of January, a couple of weeks ago. And so, in the areas where he hit, I'm not going to hit as hard, or I may skip a couple of those. And uh, for time's sake, we're, we're going to, um, again, look at verses that I feel are important. And most of 13 is important to me, I, I think, for this class. But we may skip a couple things here. So I'm going to have some folks read. And you folks online can also read. Just speak up nice and loud. But uh, anyone in the, in the worship center or anyone online, uh, if someone would read just verse 1 in John 13. Um, I want to get to that last statement, but, but first, um, Jesus knew, uh, Jesus knows he's God. Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world and go to the Father. Um, Jesus, I'm sure the, the flesh part of Jesus, the man, the all man part of Jesus dreaded the cross. And the God part of Jesus was celebrating, saying it's time to go home. Time to be reunited with the Father in person. And I love those last words. He loved them to the end. 
He loved them to the end. Jesus loves you to the end. In his dying breath, Jesus loved you. And he continues to love us. He continues to lift us up before the Father. He continues to want us to follow him for the best things, for the eternal things. Somebody read verses 2 through 4, please. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from, the, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Okay. Um, just some key points there that I want to hit. We've talked about a lot of this before, so um, there's no need to dig deep. You can go back and, and watch the other uh, videos if you need to review. But the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, um, there's, there's people who say, well, Judas can't be blamed. He was made to be a robot. Uh, Jesus allowed him to be filled with, uh, with Satan. And we know that uh, Satan was basically the cheerleader, and Satan comes into what he's welcome in, and and uh, we also know that Judas was a thief. We know at least that, right? Uh, we don't know what other sin he might have been involved with, but because of Scripture, we know that Judas was a thief. He was stealing from the money box that the disciples carried with them, and um uh, and so Jesus knowing, verse 3, knowing again he is God in the flesh, uh, that the Father had given him all things, uh, that he had come from God and he was going to God, he rose, took a towel, and girded himself. At this point, Jesus rising from the table, and it's, it's no small thing to rise from the table in that day. They were probably reclining on the floor, uh, leaning on an elbow, and when you stand up, you're really noticed. It's not like at a dinner table uh, today where you scoot your chair back and stand up. I mean, that's it's, it kind of er interrupts the flow of things, but this was a big deal. Jesus uh, begins to stand up, and I don't know if they thought he was going outside to, to do whatever or, or whatever, but uh, as he stands up, he, he girds himself, he wraps himself, in a towel, and I can just see the eyes of the disciples on him and the room getting very quiet and wondering what is going on. Let's have somebody read verses uh, five and six. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around. came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Okay, so th this had to blow their minds. Um, and, and again, Scott kind of talked about this. Um, there should have been a servant probably who would, who would wash the feet, uh, the feet of, of anyone who came to dinner uh, at the door there before, before they got in the door. Um, these are dirty, uh, awful, um, maybe camel droppings on your feet. Uh, they're walking in sandals. And, uh, and they're going to sit down to dinner, and it was just customary to wash your feet. And there was no one to do that. And so Jesus decides to do that. Jesus decides to do that. The King of kings and Lord of lords decides to wash stinky feet. I have to tell you that with this wound on my foot, Marsha will tell you that I went for a few days before I let her come near my foot. I really didn't want her to have to deal with that. Um, and I had to humble myself as she was humbling herself to take care of my foot. I had to humble myself and say, I've, I've got to let her do it. I can't do this myself. I can't even reach part of it. And uh, if it's going to get well, I have to allow her to do that. That's kind of what we're going to see here in a moment. When he came to Peter and said, Lord, are you watching my feet? Like, seriously, Jesus? You're, you've gone around the table. I know these guys, but you're gonna, you think you're going to wash my feet? Um, this is so me. And I'm wondering about you. Are, are, you uh, are you so proud? And I'm saying pride in particular. Are you so proud that 
you cannot allow yourself to let someone else bless you in whatever way it is. Uh, there was there was a uh, a preacher in the prison that I preached at for a few years. Uh, his name was Gordon, and he was the main chaplain at the prison. And uh, Gordon knew that we didn't make a lot of money, and uh, and it was everything we could do to to afford the gas to go the 90 miles to the prison and 90 miles back on a Sunday. And uh, and so one Sunday, um, he handed me a check for gasoline. And I said, you know what? Um, I've kind of decided, and I've talked to Marsha about it, we've decided that this is a gift that we're giving to the Lord, that, that we give our service, we give our money toward this. And he said, Jim, let me tell you something. Um, what you're doing if you refuse this gift is you're refusing a blessing to me because I'm blessed when I can bless you. And, and he says, don't ever turn away a gift. So guess what? If you offer me a check tonight, I'm taking it. <laughs> I'm not asking for a check. We're doing great. But I'm saying, um, if, if somebody wants to do a favor for you, if someone wants to run an errand for you, uh, I know and I know you know people too that are so proud that will never accept an ounce of help. Is that you? Yes. So question. So yeah. Uh, on this last supper, he washed the feet. How about the other two uh, Passover meals? Why didn't he wash feet then? I don't know. Maybe he did, but I, it doesn't say that, so I, I would guess not. It's such a surprise to them that I'm guessing he didn't. But here, Jesus knows because the Bible says he knew. He knew. Here is, um, in fact, when we get to 13 through 16 and all this discussion at the last supper, um, we need to know that Jesus knows there's limited time here and he's going to tell them and explain to them and be an example to them in all the things that they need to know that are the important things. And so um, this was important. This was an example that he was going to leave them. And uh, that's all I can say about that. I don't know the wisdom in it, why he didn't do it the other times or if he did, but uh, this is what we've got. So we, anything beyond that, I guess, is speculation. But good question. Good question. Uh, let's have somebody read um, verses uh, 16 and 17. I'm sorry, verses 12 through 15. And that's probably as far as we're going to get tonight. Verses 12 to 15. Okay, so I like that question. Do you know what I've done for you? Do you know what I just did? After, he's, after he has uh, washed the feet, after he's put the basin away, after he's uh, back in his place, he, he looks at the guys and he says, guys, do you know what I just did for you? He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and that's right. You got that right. I am your teacher, I am your Lord. He says, uh, and so you say well. Because that's who I am. But he says, you ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example. We talked about this before. There are foot washing congregations who actually have a ceremony that they perform in washing feet. I'm not going to throw rocks at them. But I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying here. And I believe you probably don't either. We don't belong to a church that participates in that regularly. Uh, but um, Jesus says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he uh, who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. Uh, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That's Psalm 41.9. Psalm 41.9. Now I tell you uh, before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he.
as we, I, I'm going to stop there. I was going to try to read down a little further and explain this further. But you need, to, you need to know that we will talk about what Jesus was doing here with the washing of the feet. And it's a servant's message. It's a servant's example. Jesus came to serve. He didn't come to be served. Jesus came to serve and seek and save that which is lost. Are we serving the Lord? Are we serving our brothers and sisters? The, I mean, we need to be serving our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be serving our neighbors. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And the Bible says sometimes we ought to be serving our enemies. That's hard. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. If they're hungry, give them something to eat. Well, let's chew on that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention that. That's good. Yeah, it's in Psalm 41 9, but also, yeah, it, it goes all the way back to uh, Genesis 3. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, Mark, would you close us with prayer? Amen. Hey, again, I'm sorry we weren't able to meet last week. I'm glad we're back in it. And, uh, and Lord willing, we'll be back next Thursday. So y'all have a great night. Drive careful. Love y'all. Miss you. <laughs>